Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to this Art Unlocked talk. Um, my name is Ollie McCall, and um, I'm one of the curators at Compton Verney in Warwickshire. Um, during the talk this evening, I'm going to take you on a bit of a whistle-stop um, tour of our collections. Um, and I thought I'd start by just giving a brief overview of Compton Verney um, and sort of who we are as an organisation for the benefit of those who may not have um, had the opportunity to visit. Um, so Compton Verney is an art gallery um, in rural Warwickshire. Um, we're lo located close to Stratford-upon-Avon um, and housed within a Georgian um, mansion at the heart of around 120 acres of capability brand designed parkland. Um, but as an organisation, we are much younger than the sort of outward appearance of our site would perhaps suggest. Um, so Compton Verney, the gallery was established um, by the collector, philanthropist um, and businessman Sir Peter Moores, um, who acquired the remains of the estate in the 1990s and began transforming um, what was then an empty shell of a house um, with other buildings um, into the place which we inhabit today. Sir Peter had a vision to establish a leading cultural institution in the heart of the country where local audiences could have the chance to experience world-class collections and art exhibitions. And um, today we function as an independent charity and the ambitions of, of Sir Peter still form um, part of our core values. And we aim to use our buildings, our grounds, um, our collections and exhibitions to connect our audiences with art, nature and creativity and um, aim to be a place which inspires um, our visitors. So the um, six collections that we um, are sort of custodians of at Compton Verney were amassed, uh, the majority of them were amassed by Sir Peter himself and so um, the range of, um, of content and subject matter um, reflects his uh, wide-ranging artistic interests. Um, Sir Peter also uh, would um, step in to acquire and uh, save works of art um, for the nation if they were at risk of being um, sold and maybe taken overseas. And um, so in the case of our British folk art collection, which I'll, I'll mention a little later in greater detail. Um, that was an example of, of works which were acquired in that way. Um, but as a result of Sir Peter's collecting today, Compton Verney has um, an, an eclectic and wonderful mix of collections, um, which continue to offer a real variety to our visitors and, um, and many options for, for, for the curators um within our team and also i think present some interesting curatorial um challenges uh, particularly due to the great range of, of themes and media um, which we have to work with and uh, we are undertaking work to bring sir peter's um story and his approaches and ethos to to prominence um within the interpretation um, in our collections galleries to um, clarify and make clearer um, the, the origins of our collections for our visitors. Um, I thought I would just start by sharing some images of our collections um, galleries. So we're beginning here with a couple of views of our Naples galleries. Um, and I've ordered these in the order in which um, visitors might encounter the collections if they were to visit the site. Um, our Naples collection is uh, particularly strong in, in painting, uh, but also includes examples um, of sculpture and decorative arts um, and covers a period from around 1600 to 1800. So a period which is considered to be something of a golden age um, for Neapolitan art. And the collection is probably one of the largest um, and finest outside of Italy. Um, Naples is a city which had um, personal um, significance for Sir Peter 
And um, in many ways, the works in the collection um, reflect the, the character of Naples as a city, um, a city of the senses at the crossroads between um, cultures during that period. And, um, and during that time, it was one of the largest and most cosmopolitan cities um, in Europe and a major destination for travelers on the Grand Tour. Um, and uh, as it is today, uh, a vibrant city of, of contrasts, really combining um, drama um, and hedonism with faith and superstition. And uh, all of this is conveyed through the works in our collection, um, whether those are lavish still life um, paintings, um, dramatic vistas of Mount Vesuvius um, erupting, or religious paintings and other devotional objects. Um, and next year, we're about to embark on a major um, rehang of the Naples collection, um, taking the theme of the senses as our starting point and really immersing visitors in, um, in Naples of the 17th and 18th centuries. Another view of our Naples galleries here. And then on through into our Northern European collection. Um, this collection uh, includes paintings, sculpture, and decorative um, objects such as silverware, um, produced during the period from um, 1450 to 1650. Um, and the term Northern European obviously could be applied to uh, a vast kind of swathe of the continent, um, but the majority of the works in the collection were made in what is now um, Germany. And there are also some examples um, of works produced elsewhere. So there's an early English um, alabaster carving, for example. As you might um, get a sense of from the image there, the majority of um, works in the collection are examples of religious art. Uh, we have uh, fragments from large and elaborate altarpieces, which would once have graced um, churches and chapels to smaller devotional works, which would have been intended for viewing in private homes and um, to aid in private worship. But the collection also charts the rise of the art of portraiture in Northern Europe, Europe and sort of heralding the advent of the Reformation um, and thinking about new themes which began to um, come through in the visual arts in Northern Europe at that time. So the growing appetite for uh, works with a mythological subject matter, for example, which occurred during the 16th century. Uh, and we have examples in the collection by some of the leading artists of the period, including Lucas Cranach the Elder, Ambrosius Benson and Tillman Riemenschneider, and we'll hear a little bit more about uh, him later. Continuing on, um, we get to our British um, portraits or portraits and miniatures um, collection. Uh, and this collection contains works sort of spanning the period from the mid 16th to the mid to the late 19th centuries and works in the collection um, representing many of the leading portrait artists to have worked in Britain across those centuries, um, including Marcus Gearartz the Younger, Isaac Oliver, uh, Joshua Reynolds, William Beechey, Leotard and Samuel Cooper. Um, this collection is, is one of our smallest, but it serves as an excellent um, illustration of the, the development of portraiture in Britain up to the advent of photography in the modern period. So we have examples of many different artistic approaches to portraiture within the collection from um, paintings on panels and canvas to commemorative uh, medallions, portrait miniatures, and also sculpture. So a really wide range of, of artistic approaches to, to the genre. And of course, it serves as an excellent, excellent um, teaching resource, which enables visitors to come face to face with some of the most uh, consequential figures um, from British history. And also allows us to reflect on the reasons why portraiture became such an enduring art form and some of the reasons why people might choose to um, have their portraits made. 
Uh, recently, we received a bequest of 72 portrait miniatures, which were left to us by Betty Moore's um, Lady Granchester, who was um, Sir Peter Moore's eldest, his elder sister. And this bequest has greatly kind of enriched our portraiture collection and allowed us to begin exploring new narratives specifically around the art of uh, miniature painting. And um, we additionally play host to the uh, Dumas Edgerton Trust collection, which is um, comprised of around 800 portrait miniatures, uh, which is with us on long term loan and enables us to curate um, rotating displays. So altogether, you know, we have access to one of the largest portrait miniatures collections um, in the country and have ambitions in the future to develop a dedicated miniatures gallery, um, which will really allow us to explore um, these objects and ensure that they can be better appreciated and studied. Next on our first floor, um, we have our Chinese gallery, and um, this space is home to our collection of Chinese ritual vessels. Um, a particular collecting interest and passion of Sir Peter's, um, and currently our only designated collection um, regarded as one of the um, most important and finest in Europe. Our Chinese collection centers on magnificent bronze ritual objects and vessels, um, which Chinese, uh, ancient Chinese citizens um, buried with their dead. They were produced over a period of around um, 1,500 years and under many different um, ruling dynasties in Chinese history. So ranging from the early Shang dynasty from around uh, 1500 BC, through to the Han Dynasty um, from around 207 to uh, BC to 220 AD. Um, and as in ancient Egypt, Chinese citizens believed um, that the dead required food and, and wine to sustain them in the next life, and that this should be served in vessels appropriate to their status and wealth. And so some of the most extraordinary um, bronzes um, ever cast, which are in the collection, were made for this purpose. And the collection also includes pieces of early pottery, um, such as a set of 12 ceramic equestrian figures, which were intended to be placed within a tomb um, to serve as guardians for the deceased on their kind of journey to the next life. And the forms and motifs of the works in the collection um, continue to be seen in Chinese art and culture for centuries, indeed thousands of years afterwards. Um, so this collection provides us a really unique opportunity to um, demonstrate how those forms developed over many thousands of years and continue to influence Chinese art. In our top floor galleries, we have our British um, folk art collection. And um, this collection is considered to be the largest such uh, collection of folk art in the UK. And it was assembled um, by the collector and art dealer, Andrus Kalman, um, before being acquired by Sir Peter and brought to Compton Verney. Um, the term, of course, folk art is um, much debated, I think, within the sector. And, um, and we think about it as a collection um, which includes a huge number of works produced by highly skilled um, but often anonymous makers who wish to express their creative urges um, but probably had no formal artistic training. Growing out of the long established craft traditions in local communities, folk art can encompass objects made for a specific purpose such as shop signs, um, agricultural implements, weather vanes, um, and decorative works that were created primarily for the enjoyment of the maker. Um, and we can see in the image there some great examples of um, pub or inn signs, the, the boar's head, carved boar's head on the wall to the right there. We have decorative weather vanes, um, there's one in the foreground with a farmer's figure on the top, and another with a dog on the top just behind. A decorative um, toasting fork in the shape of an animal there in the foreground, an example of uh, decorative canalware. So it is a really um, diverse collection 
um, encompassing many different creative um, and expressions, um, including collage pictures and even moving automata, um, and which would have been used as sort of moving advertisements in craftspeople's um, shop windows. So often these objects provide fascinating insights into what life was like for ordinary people, um, both in rural and urban settings, and our collection spans the sort of 19th and early 20th centuries. And um, finally, we have the Marx Lambert Gallery, um, which houses the Marx Lambert Collection. And this is a collection of um, what I think she would have termed popular art, which was assembled by the artist and designer Enid Marx and the historian Margaret Lambert. And together they shared a real love of English popular art. And um, they wrote several books on the subject um, and defined their interest in the art, uh, which ordinary people have from time, to, from time immemorial introduced into their lives. Um, the collection is uh, hugely diverse and represents many different forms of traditional craft. Um, it includes ceramic pieces, glassware, corn dollies, canalware and papier-mâché figures. And often these pieces, um, which were collected by uh, Marx and Lambert, directly inspired um, Enid Marx's own creations. And um, I'll mention a little bit more about that later on. In addition to our collections at Compton Verney, we have a year round program of temporary exhibitions. Um, so I just wanted to quickly mention a couple of recent um, and current examples of exhibitions and interventions um, in the grounds. Um, so we have a couple of installation views here of the exhibition David Batchelor Colour Is. Um, and this was a survey show, um, the first survey show of work by David Batchelor, um, bringing together works from across uh, more than 30 years of his uh, artistic career. And for much of that time, uh, Batchelor has been interested in exploring colour and the way in which we experience and try to um, rationalise and make sense of colour. Um, in everyday life and particularly in within urban um, environments. So the exhibition included um, illuminated installations, uh, sculptures, paintings, um, works on paper and animations um, and took place within our, our temporary exhibition spaces. And then um, during the same um, period, we had an intervention on the facade of the historic house um, by the artist and designer Morag Myerskoff. Um, and so here we can see the columns at the front of the house um, wrapped and the windows um, filled in, blocked in with, with um, colourful vinyl designs, which Morag created in a really playful um, intervention on the very classical architecture. And um, still to be seen within one of our meadows at Compton Verney is uh, Morag Myerskoff's uh, major installation, The Village. Um, here, Morag was responding to the history of the site at Compton Verney, and in particular, the um, history of the village of Compton Murdoch, which used to um, which used to exist on the site, and um, up until I think sort of the the end of the 14th century or thereabouts. So here, she's created a um, a village green. Um, installation of structures which families, children can, can move around, which become a sort of focal point for people meeting in the grounds and a backdrop for events and gatherings, responding directly to that history. Um, so after that uh, rather quick overview, um, I thought I would now take a look at um, a number of works in focus. I've tried to choose one from each of the collections um, and in thinking about this talk and possible kind of overarching themes, I eventually settled on the theme of ritual and celebrations. Um, I think that possibly is partly inspired by the time of year. 
Um, but also because it is a subject which um, finds expression in each one of our collections. And the first um, object that I've chosen to talk about is this ritual um, wine vessel. It's um, from our Chinese collection and it's one of the oldest um, objects in, in our collections. Um, the vessel dates from the from the Shang dynasty, um, so that period from around 1550 to 1050 BC, and it's an extremely um, rare surviving example from that period of Chinese history, and there are very few examples of vessels of this type um, which can be seen in, in public collections, or indeed in private collections. Um, so Unlike in many other ancient civilizations, um, and if we think about the Bronze Age, um, that term, the Bronze Age, is a sort of Western um, conception, but uh, roughly equivalent sort of time period um, with the Shang Dynasty. Um, in other civilizations at the time, where bronze was often used um, to, to craft weaponry or, or armor uh, or as tools. Um, in China, it appears to mainly have been used in the crafting of these beautiful ritual objects. And um, one reason for this may be the extraordinarily, um, the extraordinary efforts to which um, craftspeople had to go to create um, such objects and the attention that they required, and also the material resources. Um, bronze objects and ritual vessels such as this uh, appear to have played an important role in uh, the conceptualization of political legitimacy in ancient China and were considered to be um, spiritual objects which could uh, bestow um, or act as a signifier of divine um, favour. Um, this example is really richly decorated, um, and if we look at the surface of the vessel, we can see this uh, amazingly animated um, owl uh, motif, which appears on three of the sides, and the owl considered to be a, a symbol of good fortune um, by the ancient Chinese. There are other scrolling figures of um, serpents, or perhaps dragons on the surface, and then on the lid of the vessel, we can see two birds um, with amazing exuberant um, plumage back to back there. Um, so the vessel may once have been used uh, or owned by ro royalty or a particularly high status um, official, um, as would be befitting a, a vessel of this kind of um, quality. And it's likely that it would have been used at banquets or as part of um, ceremonies at temples where sacrifices of food and of wine were offered to the ancestors um, as, as sacrificial offerings. Often uh, vessels such as these were cast using a piece mold process uh, which involved um, the making and using of ceramic moulds. And as I mentioned earlier, we have earlier examples of um, ritual vessels in the collection. Um, so there is at least one example of a much earlier Neolithic ceramic vessel, a tripod vessel with three legs, um, which serves to illustrate how techniques uh, used in the crafting of such vessels influenced um, the later casting of these bronze objects. Um, the objects, as I mentioned, span many hundreds of years and they demonstrate how motifs like the, um, the, the anthropomorphic figures um, and motifs representing different animals or mythical creatures, particularly um, dragons, were translated from one period to the next and remained really prominent within um, Chinese art. Um, so next we are shifting through um, time and space to 18th century Naples and this wonderfully evocative painting by the uh, Anglo-Italian um, artist Pietro Fabrice. Um, and this depicts uh, the annual festival of the Madonna del Arco. Um, Fabrice painted this picture for his patron, Sir William Hamilton, who was the 
uh, British envoy in Naples at the time. Um, and it's one of the liveliest and most engaging pictures in our Neapolitan collection, um, full of action and colourful detail and including many depictions of traditional costume, um, which was worn in the Campania region uh, where Naples is located. And both um, uh, Fabrice and uh, Hamilton were, were really interested in Neapolitan customs and costumes. And we can see uh, a number of the women in the foreground um, dressed in traditional attire. Um, so relatively little is known about the life of Fabrice, uh, but he, he may have been born in England um, to a Venetian set designer uh, father and from whom he might have received some initial training as an artist. Uh, but as a young man, he received the patronage of, of Hamilton and he accompanied him on various uh, trips to Italy to document um, visits to different volcanic sites, including Mount Vesuvius. And we can see Vesuvius um, smoking away there in the background of this picture. Um, Vesuvius erupted several times during the 18th century and attracted grand tourists who were eager to take in the spectacle. Uh, and we have uh, a number of other paintings in the collection which, um, which depict um, incredibly vividly um, Vesuvius erupting and with figures standing precariously close to the, the crater. Uh, the Festival of the Madonna dell'Arco was held on Easter Monday um, at the sanctuary, which is seen on the on the right in the picture and is still a, a, a centre of pilgrimage in the region. And the sanctuary housed the miraculous um, image of the Madonna, which was believed to have saved um, saved the sanctuary from destruction during a, a prior eruption of Vesuvius in 1631. Uh, next, we're moving uh, back in time again slightly and to our Northern European collection and this figure of a female saint, um, which was uh, carved by um, one of the leading um, sculptors working in Germany in the early period of the Reformation, um, Tilman Riemenschneider. Um, Riemenschneider's work is uh, in, the, in the late Gothic style, but also appears to um, sit in that sort of transition period between the Gothic and the, the sort of Northern Renaissance, um, which was then starting to take hold. Um, Riemann Schneider settled in, in Würzburg in the late 1480s and he established a workshop there, um, which he led for over 40 years, so had an incredibly long and uh, successful career producing numerous altarpieces, statues and reliefs. Um, and his work overall, particularly the later work, um, is characterized by um, great attention to detail and, and great skill, particularly in rendering um, of garments. This figure of a saint would originally have formed um, part of an altarpiece, um, a large, a much larger um, work together with other figures of saints and um, she in originally would have held an object in her right hand, an attribute which would have helped us to identify um, her, but this has since been lost. Um, many of the, many sculptures of this period were, um, were often gilded or painted, um, but the surface finish of this sculpture suggests that it was not um, intended to be decorated. So it marks an interesting shift during which um, uh, tastes seem to be moving away from uh, the, the the highly painted and decorated to um, the to um, sort of giving um, primacy to the to the um, to the pure material, and um, this may have been due to take changing tastes in this period where the ideas of the Reformation were starting to take hold. Um, the work is carved in lime wood. Um, and this is commonly uh, used for carving or was commonly used for carving historically because um, it's easy to work and um, rarely warps. Um, but also uh, in sort of pre-Christian uh, Germanic folklore, um, the lime tree and lime wood um, was regarded as having a magical um, or religious properties. So there is a kind of ongoing tradition running through there um, in this piece from the kind of pre-Christian 
to um, to Christian um, sort of faith and ceremonies. Um, next, we come to a work from our collection of portraits, and um, this is a painting of uh, Francis Howard, um, Duchess of Richmond and Lennox, painted by Marcus Gerarts the Younger in around 1621. Um, Howard was considered to be uh, one of the um, great beauties of the Jacobean court. Um, she was descended from the aristocratic, um, she was a member of the aristocratic Howard family. Um, and this portrait was painted um, when she was around 43 years old. Um, and by this point, she had already been married uh, three times. Um, first at the age of 14 to a, a wealthy um, London alderman, then to Edmund, Ed, Edward Seymour, who was Earl of Hertford. Um, who was much, much older. And then um, here uh, in this year, she married uh, Ludovic Stuart, Duke of Lennox, who was a cousin of King James I. Um, so the portrait in many ways kind of marks uh, her arrival sort of at the height of, back to the height of um, Jacobean society. Um, the pendant that uh, Francis is wearing features uh, symbols of the of the heart and also a half moon associated with with the uh, family of her husband and this may have been a, a wedding gift that was given to her and i think it's very likely that this portrait would have been painted um in celebration of or, or commemoration of the marriage and uh, is a good illustration therefore of one of the reasons why portraits were often commissioned um, to mark significant occasions in people's lives um, Marcus Gerarts, uh, the younger, was one of the most um, fashionable and skilled portraitists um, working in England in the in the late Elizabethan um, and into the Jacobean periods. And part of that fashion for um, European artists uh, settling in, um, coming to England, settling in London and finding employment um, and that kind of cross pollination of techniques and ideas coming into England at the time. Um, next, I'm going to focus on one of our portrait miniatures, and I wanted to include this, although it also sits within our portraiture collection, um, as an example of a recent acquisition. This came to us as part of the Grandchester bequest um, by a leading um, artist in a slightly different tradition of portrait painting, um, that of the portrait miniature. Um, so this work was painted by Isaac Oliver, who um, came to England with his family um, and uh, from, from Rouen in France. Um, he, his family were Huguenot, and so they came to England to escape the French wars of religion and religious persecution that was going on at the time. Um, and he trained with Nicholas Hilliard, the great Elizabethan um, miniature painter or limner as he would have then um, termed it and developed a really distinct style um, which was more closely influenced uh, by continental um, fashions. Um, Oliver was also followed uh, by his son Peter who also became a skilled miniature painter um, but Oliver achieved, um, he became one of the most fashionable artists working in England during the late 16th and early 17th centuries and received the patronage of members of the royal family, um, including the Queen Anne of Denmark and Henry Frederick, who was um, Prince of Wales and the elder brother of, of Charles I. Um, often miniatures were painted to mark significant occasions, um, such as a marriage, perhaps um, in the event of a prolonged period of absence. Or, um, or the death of a loved one. And so I've included this as an example of the sort of ritualistic um, nature of portrait miniatures in the, um, the kind of having and holding in the hand of these really wonderful objects um, as a means of remaining close to loved ones um, and holding them in, in, in the memory. Um, the next work I want to mention is actually sort of two works 
destined to be together. Um, so the first is the painting Country Fate, painted in around 1790 um, by an unknown artist. Um, and the second uh, country procession uh, around the same time. So two works which um, deal with similar uh, sort of subject matter. And then at Compton Verney, we have them hanging together um, and it becomes clear that they're meant to hang uh, as two scenes um, of the set, two kind of uh, sections of the same scene. Um, at Compton Verney, of course, hanging within their frames, you get the pretty curious and um, humorous effect of a very elongated horse in the foreground. Um, but I've kind of reunited the two halves here in the presentation. Um, I think what's really striking about this work is um, the way in which it captures um, pleasure time um, and the enjoyment of the countryside by figures who, um, who perhaps are not members of the elite. So we might be used to seeing works um, such as um, Canaletto work, uh, depiction of Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens, um, which is also in the collection at Compton Verney, um, showing members of the gentry and aristocracy at leisure. But um, in contrast, this is um, a work which shows how ordinary folk in rural communities um, may come together to celebrate a particular um, event. Um, on the right hand side, we can see uh, gardens laid out with people promenading between them. On the left, uh, a country cottage um, with a greenhouse in the garden. And we think sort of one of the earliest depictions of strawberry cultivation as well um, captured here in this work. So you can see in the foreground center, um, there's a gentleman um, sort of selling strawberries and cream there to the passing um, folk who are all dressed in their in their best clothing. Um, so it really encapsulates, I think, uh, what many people find to be so appealing about our folk art collection, which is um, the real human element um, there and uh, an insight into the lives of, of ordinary people um, in the late 18th century. Um, and the final work which I wanted to um, refer to is, is this one. Uh, this is the representative from the, from the Marx uh, Lambert collection. And um, on the left hand side are two objects which, are, which were collected by um, Marx and Lambert. And on the right hand side is an example of a textile design by Enid Marx. Um, one of the real uh, strengths of the Marx Lambert collection at Compton Verney is the way in which it sort of demonstrates um, how the collecting of, of Marx and Lambert really fed into, um, into Marx's own design work. Um, you know, Marx was one of the most talented designers to emerge from the uh, Royal College of Art um, in the interwar period and excelled in, in many different artistic endeavours from uh, textile design to, um, to production of books to printmaking, illustration and also as a painter. Um, she was one of the first um, female designers to be designated as a royal designer for industry and is perhaps best known today for um, sort of pioneering design with moquette um, fabrics, which uh, adorned the seats of um, and continue to adorn the seats of tube trains on the London Underground. Um, but she was also a prolific printmaker and painter. She produced lino cuts, um, designs for books and um, also stamps, posters and cards. Um, in the late 30s, um, Enid Marx and um, Margaret Lambert uh, first sort of collaborated on a folk art related project, um, collecting various um, print and ephemera for a publication. And um, subsequently they established, uh, they assembled a large, uh, a wide ranging and, uh, collection of, of popular art and becoming very interested in, um, in local and traditional uh, traditional crafts. So here we can see the Horn of Plenty um, as represented by the um, pair of wall mounted um, ceramic vases and also the woven straw Horn of Plenty. Of course, 
a symbol, um, ancient symbol associated with, with peace and plenty and also the harvest, um, something linked um, very closely to sort of seasonality and, um, and rural traditions and celebrations. And um, then on the right, we can see um, how Marx has incorporated this Horn of Plenty motif into this wonderful um, block printed design um, for a pair of curtains. So um, that just about concludes um, the talk for this evening, kind of leave you with this beautiful um, view of Compton Verney across the, uh, the lake at our site. Um, I'd like to just thank you for, for joining um, me tonight. I hope you found that, um, as I mentioned, kind of whistle-stop tour through our collections interesting. Thank you for listening.